Good evening. Welcome to chapel on this seventh weekend of after Pentecost. Uh, if we gather together today under the word, uh, we'll find in our gospel reading that Jesus talks to us about judgment and control and who has it and who doesn't. And uh, it's a spoiler, it's not us. We don't have control. It, it is indeed uh, Jesus and God. Uh, but it does shape how we relate to the world around us in wanting it a certain way, our way, or the highway. Uh, these things pale in comparison to the parable that Jesus shows as a vision for what the kingdom of God is. Um, so we're going to uh, focus on that today. But as we do so, I have a few announcements for us as we depart service uh, this evening as usual. For these chapel services, we'll depart through the south door. We'll leave our offering in the drop box, and we'll head uh, in one direction to, back down to the parking lot. Also, if uh, you haven't received communion yet, please do so this Wednesday through drive-through. Um, it'll be available from six to seven. Uh, it's it's been nice. Uh, we we had folks. Uh, coming by is almost like it was being directed outside of the church, maybe by the Lord himself. But as soon as one person left, another person came. There weren't any lines, but we had communion right from 6 to 7. And uh, it took the whole hour, and, and there weren't any lines. So it's, it's time. It's time. Um, golly, I did see another announcement for us. Oh yes, so the new Bible dis or book discussion on why by Pastor Adam Hamilton is going to start this coming Saturday at 11.15 after our 10 o'clock devotion and fellowship time. I'd encourage you to do this. This book is basically answering the question, why does a loving and powerful God allow bad things to happen? Uh, it's kind of relevant to what's going on in the world around us right now. Uh, so please, you know, we've got books for free in the office, so um, join us in that. It would be great. Uh, the, those will be Zoom discussion groups. Great. I think that's it I have for announcements uh, this morning. As we think about the control and the judgment that is God's, uh, let us turn our attention and prepare our hearts and minds for worship with our opening song. My hope is built on nothing less.
I invite you to rise for the prayer of the day. Faithful God, merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom so that <coughs> Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it, let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declare it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock, I know not one. The second lesson is from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who have led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own, but will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the household came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then is, did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. 
The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will be thrown into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. Here is the gospel and our readings. Please be seated. <coughs> well, grace and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what one thing the virus hasn't been able to ruin this year? Gardening. You know why? Because you don't have to socially distance when you're gardening. You're just there. You're just doing it. It's not, did, has anybody been doing that this year? Gardening? Yeah? Yeah, George? Okay, that's great. When I was a kid, I hated to garden. It didn't matter if it was the lawn or the vegetable garden. I didn't like it. Because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't differentiate between myself what gardening meant and the work itself, which I thought was, was too hot down in Texas. It was horrible. As an adult, I've come to appreciate gardening for what it stands for, and I don't mind the word. Because as an adult, we see, unlike with eyes of children, all the things in this world that we can't control. But the garden, that piece of lawn, or those flowers, or those vegetables, there is something that we can control. We tell what's going to grow, we decide what's not going to grow. We decide how we're going to care for it. And I think that's what the real joy of gardening in. We get to exercise judgment and control. In our neighborhood, there's not a whole lot of uh, people to do vegetable gardens. But the things that everybody is involved in is the lawn. And taking care of the lawn. It almost seems like a, a competition and keeping up with the Joneses type thing. The best lawn on our street is on the corner, which is good because that's the one that the whole neighborhood sees. And the guy waters it and he mows it. He's got a really thick turf and he, he edges it with a laser. The worst lawn on our street is mine because it's not that we don't mow or edge. We don't need to because we don't water our yard. We figure if the Lord wants us to have a green yard, it'll rain. Uh, so we don't do, we don't water the yard, but we do water our flowers. So whenever you water something, whenever you take care of something, uh, something else is going to grow. And so it comes up with the flowers is also the weeds. And it's the same in the yard as in the vegetable garden. You got to take care of those re weeds. We decide what we're going to keep and what we're going to throw out, what's good and what's bad, what's desirable and what is weeds. It's something that connects uh, homes in the city with homes in the suburbs with what producers are doing out in their fields. Because right, there's nothing better than driving on a country road and looking out of the window at a field of beans or a field of corn or whatever and that's all you see in the field. Otherwise, what do we say it is? It's a dirty field. Look, it's not clean at all. It's got a if it's soybeans, it's got a volunteer corn in it, which they come and cut that out. And it's not too bad to do that if you can afford, because we've got chemicals, we can do it mechanically. But back in the day, it was backbreaking work. I'm so glad I wasn't there back in the day. My great-grandmother was famous for this, though, down in Texas by her little house. There was a cotton field, and into her 80s, she would be in there chopping weeds out of the cotton because that was her control and what looked nice, what looked right. That was her judgment on the field. And just being in her 80s didn't make her famous doing that because lots of farmers will work into their advanced years, but it, it wasn't her field. She just thought it would look nicer with no weeds. That was my grandma, or my great-grandma. My wife's family grew up <coughs> on land they rented out in Hooper, and their landlord would 
mail them letters and in the envelope would be pieces of gum for the kids and notes to her dad of where all the weeds were in the fields and that he could please go and take care of that because it was his control over his land. This is what it should look like and this is what it does. We've got to get rid of what doesn't belong. I remember when we were, before we moved to the city, we had a medium-sized garden in our backyard. It wasn't the harvest that I liked to do. I liked to watch it grow and I liked to weed because it was my control over that little slice of life. But I could tell what was going to be there and what wasn't going to be there. And if I worked for 10 minutes, a half an hour, or an hour, I could see what I had done. We had the control. We had the judgment. Do you guys think that when we step away from the garden or the flowers or the lawn or the farm, that we want to give up? that control or judgment? The answer is no. We don't. Because we want things to be the way we want it to be. We want things to be how we judge it to be. And we've seen in our society over the last couple of years some really big movements that have been generated because of this. In 2019, it was the Me Too movement. And some really big weeds in our society, we're pulled. Harvey Weinstein was probably the biggest one. We had some news anchors that were gotten rid of. We had some other entertainment type people that were gone, that were pulled. And this year, it's a lot of the racial tensions that are arising. And the judgments that are being made of what we can say, what we can't say. What we can do, what we can't do. What monuments can be up and what have to be pulled out. And in this national conversation with all these movements, with all these voices that argue and struggle with what is right and what's wrong and what's just and what's unjust, we have Jesus come and give us a vision of the kingdom of God that is completely different. But it starts out the same. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a sower that goes out and he plants good seed, but at night an enemy comes and plants weeds. And then when the seeds grow, they produce grain, but the weeds grow along with them. And the servants come <coughs> to the master and they say, didn't you plant good seed? Where did all these weeds come from? It's like, didn't you create this world good? Where did all this evil come from? And the, uh, Jesus says, the sower says, uh, that the enemy came and sowed these. And the servants say, well, don't you want us to go collect all the weeds and pull them out? Don't you want us to get rid of all the bad stuff? Toss it? Don't you want us to pull out the statues? Don't you want us to get rid of the creeps? Jesus says, no, let them grow with the wheat. And then at the end of the age, when the harvest comes, the weeds will be collected, thrown into the fire, and the wheat will be collected and kept in the barn and preserved. And Jesus gives an explanation to this, and he labels the different parts, which we should be thankful for, because he doesn't do that very often. It says, he is the sower, the field is the world, the children of the kingdom, you and I are the good seed, the bad seed, the weeds are the children of the evil one, who is the devil who sows. And the people that judge, the ones that come to reap, are the angels. What is our role? in this vision of the kingdom. It's to be good seed. It is not to judge. It is not to pull out. The problem 
we have, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, in our society is that we hate evil more than we love good. And when the servants come to the master and they say, don't you want us to pull these weeds? The master says, no, I don't, because when you pull these weeds, you may pull out good stuff too. And it's better to let the weeds remain than to destroy something that's good. It's so hard for us to wrap our minds around that because we like to destroy, we hate what is evil more than we love what is good. And who cares what gets destroyed or who gets destroyed in the meantime? Because it's for the cause. Jesus is speaking directly to us today. So what are we supposed to do then? If we're not judging, if we're not pulling out the weeds, if we're not getting rid of the bad stuff, what are we to do? Well, we're to be good seeds. And maybe Jesus is telling us today that we should love good more than we hate evil. That as the good seed grows with the weeds, that the good seed's role is to forgive. Maybe even to suffer the weeds. So that in their zeal to get rid of it, good isn't destroyed. The problem is if you've got a group of people that have been suffering for a really long time, if you've got some seeds that have been suffering the weeds for a really long time, it's a hard message to hear. I get that. And yet that is what the Lord is telling us today. This is what the second reading is talking about when the world has been groaning in labor pains until now. The suffering is going to continue, but it's going to stop. Because at the end, when it's time for the harvest, judgment will come. And I have to say thanks be to God that that judgment is not mine. Because if it's up to me, some good might be destroyed. And if it's up to you, some good might be destroyed. And that's not given to us to do. So, my prayer for you this week, even if it's just this week, is whatever passes on the news or in the world or at home, that we not try to judge it, that we not try to get rid of it, uh, but endure next to it and even forgive it so that we can love good more than we hate evil. Amen. At this time, I invite you to rise as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of the harvest, you sow the good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ into your field your church throughout the world to be both diligent and patient, full of resolve and gentleness, that our witness may be faithful to your intentions, Lord, in your mercy.
God of all space and time, your whole creation groans in labor pains, awaiting the gift of new birth. Renew the earth, sky, and sea so that all your creation experiences freedom from the bondage of decay. Lord, in your mercy. God of the nations, teach us your ways that we may walk in your truth. Mend the fabric of the human family now torn apart by our fearful and warring ways. Guide us by your mercy, grace, and steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy. God of hope, you accompany those who suffer and are near to the brokenhearted. Especially this day, we pray for those suffering from uh, racial iniquity and from oppression of any kind. Open our hearts to your children who are lonely and abandoned, who feel trapped by despair and all who suffer in any way. Lord, in your mercy. God of the seasons, in the midst of summer, give us refreshment, renewal, and new opportunities. We pray for the safety of those who travel. We pray for those who cannot take the rest they need. Lord, in your mercy. God of life, those who have died and you shine like the sun in your endless kingdom. We remember with thanksgiving the saints of all times and places and saints close to us. Gather us with them on the day of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, go and share God's word. Show God's love. Serve God. Amen. Hallelujah.